One quick announcement at the beginning, there's going to be a hosted social at my house immediately after tonight's presentation. Um, uh, Thad should have sent the address out, if not 798 Juniper. It's a 10 minute walk, kind of nestled back in there behind. Um, it'll be the usual uh, food, which arrives at 530 for those of you who plan your arrival time when the, when the food shows up. So go ahead and do that. And so um, it's my pleasure um, to introduce um, tonight's Ecology Center speaker, Dr. Marie-Josie Fortin. Um, Dr. Fortin is a professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Toronto. Um, she holds cross appointments in both the statistics and geography departments as well. And she has held previous positions at Simon Fraser University in Canada, University of Montreal and University of Sherbrooke in Canada as well. Her research record in uh, what I would broadly characterize as landscape and geospatial analysis is quite astonishing, um, including greater than 425 published papers and five books. Um, she ranks in the 0 0.01, that is one one hundredths of 1% of scientists um, to, according to a, a study in PLOS. She's a fellow in the Royal Society of Canada. She's worked with Science Without Borders before where she worked in Brazil um, for quite some time and serves on numerous um, distinguished councils including the United Nations Environment Program, World Conservation and Monitoring Center. Uh, she works with Canada Parks and Wilderness, as well as among others. Among her um, many other honors, she was a distinguished visiting professor fellow at the Swiss Federal Institute for Forest, Snow, and Landscape Research, which, of course, is one of the first places we met. I apologize this, but it was several decades ago, so I inadvertently probably just aged um, Rejosi along with myself. Um, and her talk tonight is entitled Ecological Networks in Dynamic and Evolving Landscapes. And last, don't forget Thursday's moderated discussion with Dr. Fortin be held at four o'clock here, um, there, and Eric, Erica Stuber, there she is in the back with her hand up. She will be facilitating those. And if you have any questions after tonight's talk, get those to Erica real soon so she, we can start the juices flowing in the discussion period tomorrow. And so with that, please give a warm welcome. Uh, Josie Martin. Good afternoon. And I would like uh, to make sure you hear me in the back. Thank you, fantastic. And uh, thank you all to have invited me. I think it's uh, because of the grad student of, of uh, their decision of having me, and I'm very grateful. It's been a fantastic day today to meet a lot of you and tomorrow as well. And the question I received today quite a bit is what makes me excited as research? Well, the title here is make me very excited. And I hope that you will be excited as well at the end of my talk, or I will discourage you. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> But basically, I'm interested in network ecology uh, from a spatial context, but also species interactions. And I will present a little story on that uh, throughout the lecture. And most of the work I'm going to present is published. So if you miss something, I would say just go read. And I will just go view, give you an overview of all those topics without going too much in depth. So first of all, uh, we are interested all in species distribution, especially with climate change. And uh, we can see that depending of the spatial scale at which we are looking, the globe, the region, the landscape, or locally, some factors are more important than others. So you have climate topographies, maybe the same throughout the scale, and land use is maybe more locally or at the landscape more important. And this is something that we've been studying for a long time, the influence of the environment. And this is based on Achin and Grimm, where they have this kind of niche vision that abiotic uh, consideration were the most important one. 
Then, uh, because we are fragmenting a lot the landscape, we don't have as many large area as we used to, but we still use this kind of theoretical framework of species area relationship, where as we have more area, there would be more species richness. So it's all linked to land use, climate change, and how the species uh, diversity is maintained in our nowadays changing landscape. So here, the processes that will favor or uh, improve local diversity could be dispersal. And dispersal can decrease better diversity because there's more movement in the landscape. And then maybe a dispersal also will maintain the uh, local persistence of species. And those different lines here is different level of dispersal from the, the less dispersed to the most dispersed with the numbers here, showing that more dispersal there is, more homogeneous region and more species richness there could be. But in the last maybe decade or so, people realized that uh, biotic interaction, species interaction is also crucial. And that's maybe also more at the local scale and this Elton niche uh, vision of not only adiotic factors are important, but uh, biotic factor. So if we revise this kind of vision, we can say now maybe what we need to look is not that individual species richness, but relationships. So maybe traffic level, materialist competition, predation. Whoops, sorry, went too fast. And ma what we maybe need to look at is a relationship of network area relationship where at small scale, maybe the food web is smaller and there's a meta web through the larger region. So that's a little bit where I'm interested in, in this kind of where the meta web is complete and how the sub network of relationship exists and how this is affected as well by the loss of habitat. So here from the left to the right, we see that we have more resource which have more prey and omnivore and predator, and the circle indicate their potential of dispersal ability in the landscape. And as there's less and less resource, we are maybe losing food webs species in their function in the landscape. So the same way that we had previously, we can look at this dispersal ability and how it will affect the network and now with the loss of habitat, we're going to have uh, fewer complex food webs and the dispersal limitation will also affect that. So this is a little bit uh, those topics of interest to me. And I will present to you a few research that try to address either habitat loss, either habitat or a combination of them. So by doing so, if we understand better the ecological network, it will allow us to uh, be able to maybe scale up the network structure and understand how community and food web will respond to the perturbation and disturbance across different spatial scales. So I've been using very uh, generally uh, the term ecological network. What do I mean? Uh, I could mean a lot of things. So there's ecological network that are maybe bipartite, plan uh, insect pollinization network, a tripartite where maybe there's a parasite, a food web, or what we call a way to analyze the trophic interaction with motif where you have predator, competitive species, and so on. And the little circles say that those relationships will change through time. And then there's special network where I'm mostly mo known for, where I look at patches and the dynamic of patches through space to accommodate meta community or change from one ecosystem to another. So the thing is the change in the environment, the habitat, the spatial network will influence the ecological network 
and there's some kind of constraint of how the species can uh, accommodate themselves in a more fragmented landscape and how the species can modify the ecosystem, the function as well. So there's a feedback effect between those scales. So the title was Opposing Dynamic and Evolving Network. And this is really to stress the fact that a network, those little nodes and the link between them, uh, they can change the quality of it. So the network structure is always the same, but the quality of the patch or the movement of animal in such a network is uh, varying through time, but the network itself doesn't change the topology versus the network is evolving because of destruction, condensation, extinction of different nodes. So that's important to realize that a network can evolve and the dynamic on the network also can change. And this is an illustration where you have maybe a steady state where you have a kind of network of interaction between species. There's a perturbation, there's some kind of reaction to it, a transient state, and then there will be a new state. So maybe we have a new equilibrium of species interaction that has been uh, promoted by, oops, by that perturbation. So the, Story I want, to, I'm a storyteller now. I'm going to tell you stories about uh, different aspects of uh, network dynamic and evolving network. So I have three topics I want to cover, one in marine ecosystem, one in freshwater and the microcosm experiments versus forests that they are evolving in the landscape. So I will start with talking about trophic level interaction in the marine ecosystem, coral reef uh, system. And this is to assess the fact that apex predators are indeed affecting the, the trophic level, the structure of the ecosystem. So they are really uh, modifying the ecosystem in which they are living. And I'm going to study shark that are harvested too much in the last decades or so, and how they are kind of their absence is going to change the traffic level in the coral reefs. So here is a cartoon of a very healthy coral reef where you have shark and good coral benthic cover. And as population, human population density increase, we are harvesting more and more the shark, and then we're destroying the coral reef and the benthic cover. So this loss of biomass of shark is really affecting the ecosystem. So they are really uh, a key Asian in this ecosystem. So a former student of mine, Jonathan Ruper, in his PhD, look at these food webs between the shark, the carnivore, the pestivore, the coral algae cover, and human activity to see how we can understand the importance of uh, uh, lowering the abundance or completely removing shark in some part of the uh, Pacific Ocean. So we were lucky to have access to existing data set that been uh, uh, surveyed for a period of five years. So it's dated a little bit. This is of course already not the reality that we are facing now, but we had fish abundance mystic survey for 650 about location for a 17 country. We regroup the species of fish in carnivore and herbivore, and we kept the shark. And then there was a study that say in the Pacific Ocean, there's maybe four uh, regions. So we use them to see how the fish population, the corals and the impact of sh shark uh, will differ. So we have this kind of black region, the red, the triangle in blue and green, just going to call them that way. So basically, uh, there's different uh, properties that create those zones. And we try, try to address this hypothesis of how uh, apex predator like shark are structuring the ecosystem using structural equation modeling. So here is our kind of cartoon, our DAG, of the shark are 
going to affect the carnivore and they're going to affect the herbivore, the coral cover affect the shark, the carnivore and the herbivore and the habitat uh, is also affecting all those uh, differently. And then there's human intervention. So how the human are affecting, they are harvesting the shark, the carnivore and the cover uh, coral is destroyed. So we had this model, and then here I'm showing you for each of the four regions, the different kind of result that we obtain. And we can see that there, here I just show you those that were significant. So negative impact of human on shark, then positive effect of human on carnivore, the depth was important, uh, the habitat and the coral was negatively uh, impacted by human. And you see that there is change from all the different sectors. And one thing that we were surprised is that in some places, like in the red sector and in the, where is it? In the um, green sector, the shark had no impact on the food web structure that we were hoping to find. But the two other in the black and the uh, triangle in blue, we had responses. So I'm asking you a question. What do you think we then had any relationship in those two sectors? Because, I will give you the punch. Uh, already the shark was so depleted, their abundance was so low that they could not have any impact. So they were already so uh, harvest that their population abundance was very low. So I think this is a good example that structural equation modeling by this region help us to better understand that is not the same response throughout. And the big take home away of this uh, research was that, uh, so not surprise, surprise, human activity is affecting coral reef, but not the same throughout the uh, Pacific Ocean. And that we have the fishing predation of the shark that is top down from the human that has pressure and the degradation of the benthic cover also was important. So this is a kind of a, a network in space and time that allow us to better understand the dynamic of the system. The next study is about uh, here we, in some way knew the trophic level by the fish species identity. But there's sometimes where we don't know what is the food web between species and in a fresh water system, we wanted to build what are the species interaction indeed. So here the question was, do species interaction, so are they changing according to the season? And now the species interaction, we were thinking of species turnover or rewiring between them. And which are the traits that affect this uh, change in season of the relationship? So this is work from uh, a current PhD student of mine, uh, Chris Brumacon, and a former student, Corinne Borner. And uh, we try to assess all those factors of environmental condition, bio, uh, biotic interaction, and uh, our response variable that we studied is, like I already mentioned, is uh, turnover or rewiring. So it's all about beta diversity changes through the season. So we use, just for some of you that are not familiar with this terminology, what I mean by uh, turnover is that the interaction change and there's new species. So in the fall, maybe I had the really big relationship between species A and B, and in the spring now is A and E. And rewiring the species all the same, but the interaction was mostly with A and B, and in the spring was with C and, and B. So this is what we were measuring with the beta diversity uh, index for species interactions. So we use NEON data. We had nine uh, sites that we uh, were able to get fish data, the age, the length, the weight, uh, the species identity in the fall and in the spring for three years. And we had the NEON, this fantastic data set available, uh, water temperature, dissolved oxygen. And we had this kind of layout of data through the seasons. So the species 
uh, composition, uh, 32 in the fall, 34 in the spring, an overlap of 29 in both season. And you see this kind of histogram showing that some species were present, like the long-nosed dice was mostly present only in the spring, and some were more abundant, less abundant, so on and so forth. So now we have this data set. How do we build relationship between the fishes in the spring and in the fall? So we use this method developed by Normal and Al in publishing methods in ecology and evolution, where they are trying to affair this kind of species interaction using a, a network, they call it tree-based, but it's a network analysis of species based on their abundance. So the first step is to use a log, a Poisson log normal models of joint distribution of the species interaction, controlling for the environmental factor that we had, and then take that and build this with this uh, EM algorithm, the topological structure of interaction among each pair of species. And this is a bit from their paper. So you have the date, the site, the abundance of species, and then you can build this relationship and fur network. It's an infer. I mean, it's not observed, it's infer network. So that's what we, we got in the fall and in the spring. And of course, the abundance changed. The layout is not the same. It's hard to have exactly the same layout, but the colors, we have uh, some, uh, uh, insectivore, uh, herbivore, uh, piscivore. So we have different species that we know their diet and we know that based on fish trait with some were not so obvious to, they were more than one trait, of course. And then just to show you, there's this, this brown trout here that is a piscivore. And then this one that is a more herbivore, insectivore, the mosquito fish. So where they are in the fall versus where they are in the spring. So there was more relationship or less relationship depending of the season uh, for those two species. We could do that for all the species, but it's a little bit of overwhelming thing, but it's just to show that there is change in those interactions. So the next thing we wanted to see is uh, what are the, Turnover is a turnover or rewiring. So all the species now are here. And we have uh, in red here is to show the pestivore species. And the different bar here is to show how many species uh, they change from the fall and the spring. So they were turnover for some species. Some were having the same relationship with some species and new relationship, new re rewiring or turnover. Uh, the middle ones, they were all turnover, new uh, assemblage of species, so on and so forth. So there were 29 species that had rewiring. So that's give us this better diversity of rewiring that 80, 81% of the change in the network were due to the rewiring versus 19 of species turnover. So then we wanted to know, well, what are the property that will favor this high level of rewiring? And uh, then we look at the distribution and the, here we just show uh, the length of the fish and which one were piscivore and non piscivore to make it a little bit simple. And then the number of total number of rewiring was obviously uh, mostly dominant on big fish and piscivore species. So the takeaway from this research was that, uh, well, yes, there are change, mostly rewiring and turnover, and that large piscivores uh, had maybe multiple prey and uh, the, across multiple trophic level, providing maybe a stability of this food web. So this is a kind of uh, research that could we expanded in another paper on uh, not only the seasonality, but the ontology, the juveniles versus the adult. Then uh, those studies, you take data set from others, and I'm being known to parasite data set from other people. I sign a lot of data agreement. And I said, well, it'd be nice to have something that is more an experimental design. 
So uh, we'll look at a microcosm and uh, how we can use a multi-trophic meta-community uh, recovery after some disturbance events. So is to try to address this thing of habitat loss and dispersal. How can in a microcosm we can destroy a bottle or lower the quality of a bottle and uh, limit the dispersal and see how the system responds to it. So this is the work of a former PhD student, uh, Karina Perkowski, and in collaboration with Mark Kedot, where we were trying to see how disturbing that we know deplete community and erode environmental heterogeneity, how the species diversity richness is coming back after such events. And we use a combination of microcosm and a spatial explicit modeling to address that, where we have uh, modeled the interaction between environmental heterogeneity, dispersal, and species interactions. So this has been published. It's a bit complex. So if you don't understand everything, it's okay. Uh, so you can read it back. But here is the little bottles. There were five bottles connected by those tubes. It was replicated eight times. So we have each kind of group of five, five patches. So each bottle, we call that a community or a patch. And they're, because they are linked to one another, we call that a meta community. And then we have this process system where we have four trophic level in some cases. So we had nine protozoan species and uh, resource, the bacteria, the food. So we have a top predator, a mesopredator, phrase, and the resource. So this is the four trophic level. But then we have, so here, those four species, we call them prey. And these three, we call them non-prey because they were not uh, eaten by the top predator or the mesopredator. predator. So we have kind of two food webs in the same system. Uh, so then, so this was the lab. And as you know, uh, you cannot do everything with bottles and student need to graduate. So basically there was limit of experiment design that one can do. So based on the model or the system here with the protis, we were able to calibrate a model. So we calibrate what we call the spatial explicit species interaction meta community models, mouthful, I would just say the model, that is a general lotobacteria model at metitrophic food web, where the community of the patches are connected by those tubes, the corridor, so the dispersal possibility. So the model is where we have the abundance of each species in each patch or each co community. And then we see how this is affecting the next time step as a function of grow, as a function of the environmental matching. So all of those uh, protozoan, they have an optimal grow and we uh, maximize that in the model. Then we have the species interaction that come from the literature. So interaction factor, then the dispersal rate and immigration function. So based on this, we try to see, can we get with the same experimental design that we had in the lab, can the microcosm, can we get the same result in the uh, model? So then uh, this is in the review. Uh, Karina uh, developed this kind of very complex uh, design. So there's several things happening here. First of all, like I said, in the lab, she could not do as much as in the field. So the gray uh, box are the uh, design that were done in the lab. And in the model, we could do all of them. So first of all, the trophic level was given by the species, the four level. Uh, but in the model, we can say, well, maybe all the species are having just competitive, you know, there's not have a trophic level. So we oppose that. Uh, are they dispersing or not? So. Uh, in the model, they were always dispersing. Uh, we didn't do the context where they were not dispersing. But then we changed the amount of disturbance. So none of the patches in the meta, meta community was uh, destroyed. Then only one, two, three, et cetera, all of them. 
And then we change the dynamic of the environment. So those processes are responding to the light. So they are able to, uh, so we could change the environment by changing the light regime. So that's what we mean here about environmental heterogeneity. So we have the same light regime, then in the model, we can change different kind of spatial heterogeneity, temporal heterogeneity, and then we have spatial temporal heterogeneity in the model and in the lab. So here is uh, really a case where uh, we could explore all those processes at once and see the dynamic of response of the system. So the four responses that we were expecting, well, no chance. The species richness would be the same throughout. There could be immediate loss of species diversity. There could be a, a decrease and maybe coming back uh, through recolonization of patches. And then there could be a lag uh, in the species response. They don't respond right away to the disturbance or change in the environmental heterogeneity, and then they decrease. So those are the kind of response we were expecting. OK, this is a very busy slide. <laughs> so let me try to explain to you. So this is resolved from the microcosm. Again, I just show you the traffic level to remind you of it. And uh, there's the log abundance and the log biomass of each of the processes that were sampled. And then we have time series through time, how they were sampled. So here we have all the species, regardless if they were predator, prey, or non-prey. That's why I put this back here. And uh, the, I know it's very hard to see the distinction, but the lower series of lines are circle for the mean of each community. And the square is the mean of the meta community, the five patch together. So then with five patch, there's more potential of speed abundance and biomass. And you can see that those different lines is based on the different traffic level that we have seen here. So the take home message here that I want you to uh, take away is that if you look at all the species without looking at separate predator, prey or non-prey, you, you will miss some interactions. So here there's kind of this kind of uh, first, the system take time to regulate. So if you don't study the system long enough, you would think this crashing, but maybe it's coming back and you will miss it. So the time of this analysis is crucial to uh, be able to catch those uh, lag effect. And again, if you look at the, all the species, you miss that the predators are kind of doing pretty good. The prey, they have some kind of issue and the non-prey were not as high in the abundance. So those are things that are giving us more insight in the system. Then, okay. Then things don't work as much as one would like, of course. So this is a very uh, complex plot uh, again. So now we wanted to measure the recovery of the species richness, right? The proportion of species. So the, the recovery for us was the proportion of species before the disturbance. So there were all nine species in each bottle. So how many uh, were back at the end of the time series analysis? Sorry. Uh, so how many stayed and how many come back? You know, so we see that some species came back. So we wanted to assess that. So the plot here is uh, the spatial temporal homogeneity uh, scenario. The one line is this kind of coming back to the initial condition. So is the full recovery. If the value is larger than it, so the green ones here, is mean that we gain some species and the value below is we lost some species. So here, uh, this is before disturbance. So we started with nine species, but there was some, we let the system stabilize and then we, dis we create a disturbance. So in some cases, there were not nine species. So the recovery, so that's why we have more species sometimes that one would think. So here, what are we saying? So 
The macrocosm is in green, the model is in pink, and then we have at the community or meta community level, and then the same thing for the microcosm. So here, uh, there were kind of loss of species, most of it in the uh, model, but in the experiment, we could see that at the community level, the system reestablished or didn't lose as much. This is the condition are homogeneous within change heterogeneity in the system. Then there's the case that were possible only with the model in pink. And then you could see that sometimes the temporal heterogeneity within lose many species, except when all the bottles, of course, were empty, destroyed. And this here, this was the case of the spatial heterogeneity. So in losing just one bottle was not too bad, but uh, you could see the impact of destroying patches had more impact. And in the last case here, we had the microcosm as well, where now the species response is uh, coming back. So what the model is able to do is only what we tell the model to do. So, you know, there's limitation. The model cannot uh, respond the way that the protest in the bottles and the community dynamic did. So this is important to say that when we use model, maybe we're missing some properties and we do our best. I think our model was quite complete, but we missed some interaction. So the first take home message is a little bit, uh, I already mentioned it, there's maybe lag response. So we need to have maybe a monitoring of the system for a longer period after disturbance was crucial. Then uh, fragmentation, fragmentation here is to have less bottles uh, with erod uh, speciability to respond to the system and to recover. But uh, maybe the species interaction was more important than dispersal. And it depends if they were predator or non-prey. So this is a case where the predator maybe contribute to species prey synchrony through the spatial coupling and species sorting. And then the non-prey uh, maybe uh, were more affected by the asynchrony between the patches. So this is uh, where a real experiment was performed to assess the dynamic in space and time of species interactions. And the last uh, study I would like to show to you is uh, back to uh, evolving uh, network. And this is in the case of forest resilience. So forest is a dynamic system over a longer period of time, of course, and they are uh, subject to disturbance, fire, harvesting, uh, insect outbreaks, and lately drought. And how can we create more resistant forests uh, to those perturbations? So here is a complex uh, figures uh, with Brian Sutervin, a colleague, where we look at what are the disturbance and how they affect the function of forest. So there's the micro scale, the stand, then we have the meso scale, the landscape, and the biome or micro scales. And the models that uh, Brian and I are using the most is at the landscape scale where we're interested in big disturbance, assuming that the demography succession, the seed, uh, uh, seed bed exists and so on and so forth. So there is germination, but those things, if they don't occur, well, you don't have any uh, forest. And then climate change or the social economic pressure, economic policy, extreme pulse, climate things will influence the forest recovery. So we, we know that there's a lot of fragmentation. I'm bringing you to Southern Ontario just to show you that there's a lot of forest patches and very small lots, uh, wood lots throughout the landscape. And if we were to establish a better resistant forest for uh, drought and pest outbreaks, maybe the forest could maintain itself. So here we want to establish forest 10. And sometimes it's easy, like I showed you, we clearly see the position of forest 10. In some places, it's not as easy. But let's say that for 
the sake of argument, we're able to identify some stands of forest and how far they are from one another and how seed can disperse from one location to another. So the first premise of this work of forest resilience is to assume that indeed we can have a network of patch based on forest stands. Then the question is, how can the species that are in those stands can resist to those different disturbance? So this is a work led by Christian Messier, a colleague and others, where we propose this kind of, what can we do? So the same thing that we can uh, evolve the system, the network is by adding patches so we can create plantation. Then we can maybe the existing patches, maybe we can change the composition. We can make non-host trees. We can maybe have trees that are drought resistant. And then we can maybe change the way of harvesting to favor some species. So this is a bit the principle. So we want to have a network approach where each forest stand is going to have some kind of connectivity adjacency to others. And we're going to see which species trays are going to promote the resistance to those different uh, uh, conditions. So it's kind of a... Uh, full blown imagery I'm going to show you in one moment. So this is what I showed you, what we can manipulate. Then we want to measure how uh, valid those uh, things were. So here we have the add of a plantation will create more connectivity, more network links between them. So we're going to measure the functional diversity of each stand, the redundancy in species diversity and the functional connectivity. And these are the kind of things we go going to say, do we have more two type of species or do we have more a variability of species? So we have this two, the species richness is two, the functional diversity is maybe high, but the redundancy is low versus five species where both are high. And then we're going to establish what is the network between the patches, uh, change the management practices, look at the impact of disturbance and assess the functionality. So this is what uh, Nuria Hidoué did in her PhD under Christian Messier and uh, Louis Breton and myself, where she look at the, those index of response of diversity and uh, redundancy based on different functional traits of trees. So there was many functional tree traits, but I will present only two of them, drought tolerance and pest persistence. Then we look at network property. So more patches, more closely would be more connection or recognition from seed. Uh, is there some patches that are kind of a hub, more bigger patches at the center of this network? And modularity, maybe there's some kind of uh, group of patches that are more in uh, pockets of uh, areas. So the study area was, uh, at the site that was pretty big, seven, a thousand square kilometer where 40 percent was forest cover all this gray uh, the circle is where we had the sample sites and uh, there were 34 species that were collected we knew their abundance and functional trait but again i'm just presenting two of them and uh, this is the saint lawrence river so this is the study area it's quite large and it's mostly mostly deciduous trees in that region uh, maple syrups, and you see there's some kind of big patches and uh, small woodlots throughout this region. And this was a study that the people in this region wanted our help to better manage their forests and say, where should we plant? What should we plant to make our forest more resilient to drought and species um, pest uh, outbreaks? So from this kind of map, the first step was to create those nodes of forest. So all those circle and there's million of small ones that you cannot see are the different size uh, position of the forest stand, where the color here is saying that those are very huge patches and those that you don't see in black are very small. The circle size is to say how much those patches were um, 
at the center, the hub. So this was the big, most central patches, but there were other. And then you cannot see the distinction, but there's some that are more linked to other patches than others. So this was their starting points. And then what the Nuria did, she kind of said, if I was to harvest 5% of the patches or 10% of the patches, how this is going to change my kind of connectivity, centrality, and patch size. So this was done, not in the modeling, she did that by hand, you know, she would throw random patch out uh, just to see the response. And then she did the same thing for, well, where should I put plantation? Where should I improve uh, by different species trait resistant to drought or pest and enrichment? How this is going to improve the quality of each stem? So that's also what she did. So we summarized the information into those radar plots where each uh, dash line is 50 25% increase in uh, the measure that we use. We use the connectivity, modularity, and centrality. Those are all the connectivity one and functional diversity and redundancy. So what are we seeing here? We are seeing the reference, the initial condition was a case where the connectivity was very low, the centrality not so high, functional diversity not so high, but redundancy was good and not so high modularity. Then if we are using plantation, we were able to make it more connected and central, but didn't change much the redundancy and diversity and uh, decrease the modularity. I myself think is a good thing because modularity means that you have pockets, maybe they are not as well connected to others. So I think that was not a so big issue. And then the same thing for the enri enrichment where we were able to move at least the diversity in a part of the initial condition. So then here is the plot where we focus only in the case where we uh, have trees that were for drought tolerance once, if they were in enrichment in existing patches or in the plantation versus pest resistance, non-host species. And the same thing, as I know it's a little hard to see, but the blue is the reference to the starting condition. And then the different colors is the amount of plantation that was uh, increased in the landscape versus the amount of patches that were enriched. So the thing that is clear is that here we have for the drought, we were able to make it more connected, more centrality, but we decreased the redundancy, but increase diversity. So you can see it's, uh, you solve one aspect, but maybe at the expense of another aspect, because then for the drought, we were not able to do as much uh, good. So this was one study and um, amazingly, she did that with just uh, by hand in some ways, you know, with computer, do this, do this. We didn't do a model of changing the landscape. And then Marco Mina came and we redid the same analysis, this time using Mendes II with the Phoenix succession and this kind of scenarios. And there was very five sector in this landscape. So we kind of summarized the data after in those five sector, but we had the current uh, climate condition, moderate increase, high increase, business as usual for uh, the harvesting, and then some kind of generic disturbance. So generic disturbance being uh, harvesting, insect outbreak, and drought. So to show you the uh, overall results, so through times, we model it until 2000. Uh, in French, we say 2,100, sorry, I'm always confused. But this date. And um, so the control where we had the different, the current climate condition in green, moderate increase of climate in purple, and in orange, the higher uh, concentration. 
And if we were just harvesting business as usual, how the biomass above ground will change. And if we have disturbance, the biomass would decrease. So this is for all the species uh, diversity, but if we look specifically, let's say red maple, sugar maple, basil fir, birch, and uh, emlock, the response was different. So again, this depends on which species you are uh, looking at, but the hemlocks have a lot of hard times and the birch, while it's successional, there's also the successional, they are kind of uh, early succession. So they've been replaced by other species. So this study was throughout the five location. And then we did the same thing of functional diversity, uh, redundancy uh, and connectivity for uh, the five region. Now the five region are the axes and to see how much those systems, some region were better in redundancy. We have more success in some region than others. Uh, and so on and so forth. So the take home message here is that uh, by using forest then as node, we can assess more the functional network of a forest. The functional traits and connectivity improve the resilience, not always with some trade-off of course of disturbance. The functional enrichment of forest then was a win-win strategy. So the instrument of functional diversity and connectivity was improved. And then the plantation was a good way to uh, help to cope with uh, pest uh, outbreaks and drought. So I hope I showed you that uh, there's an interplay between the network structure. So at the stand, level, like I showed you, this is my little forest in different qualities. So the topology will constrain the function and the function can modify the topology. And then the layout of the landscape will affect species interaction, nutrients, competition, predation, and so on and so forth. So the interplay between uh, the topology of the forest or stem in the landscape uh, are important and there's a, there's a trade-off with species interaction and we need to study that more. And maybe to model spatial temporal network will give us a better way to maintain ecological functions. I play a lot with those models. And here I just want to finish that. I've been using that a lot for conservation context. So those are all kind of mm, different papers where we try to validate connectivity, incorporate stepping stone, look at space and time, look at the uh, range shift in traffic level, forest resilience, what I should show you. I have in a textbook, I have things to do, right? I've just read textbook. And then with coral reef and uh, the last uh, research here is about invasive species, the same thing about resilience of forest patch. You can have that for protected area. How are they resilient to invasive species? So we'd like to thank all my co-author, my funding sources, and I can take some questions. 